Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 30-minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Mark the Man Tipton. Oh, the man. Thank you. I, this, I do. Is not a, this is not a Becky Lynch reference. Oh, it's not? Okay. This is a Stan. The St- man. Stan the man? Yeah. Okay. I appreciate Stan the man, but I do understand the... The popularity of Becky Lynch at this point, and I am among those who is a fan, so so I don't I don't mind that. Although I'm not a fan of the gimmick, so to speak, I I do appreciate the monikers always. Um, and this week we have a, a a subject for the 30 minute Midas Touch podcast that interests me immensely. It's a kind of a a, a strategy, for lack of a better word, I need to think of a better word than that for how you should present things and plan things in professional wrestling to tell a compelling story to involve a continuous story really Mm -hmm. to involve the audience in the ongoing story which is really you know you all tell stories in the ring Mm -hmm. and from week to week there are stories that are told that continue on and one of the things that uh, is used to do that is something that is known as transition champions Mm mm-hmm and we, and we spend a lot of time here on the 30-minute Midas Touch, kind of giving people the the accurate definition for a lot of these wrestling terms that have been taken over by the internet wrestling community and morphed into whatever, like Jobber, like we talked about that before. So a traditional champion, um, like I said, this is, this is a common tool. It's been used for decades in professional wrestling. Um, but sometimes the traditional champion gets a bad rap because um, they feel like the company's not putting enough faith into whoever. Why can't they be champion for six months or a year? Why can they only be champs, champs for six weeks? Uh, and it's nothing like that. It's just that, you're, like you said, you're telling stories. You understand? And you've got to plan and play. So when people are, are transitional champions, they're not being punished. You know, they're, you know, they're in the spot. You know what I mean? Like, they're not the number one guy, but they're number two. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, we, we can start with, like I said, Stan the Man Stasiak. Oh, okay. I mean, that, that's a prime example. He, um, he beat Pedro Morales, you know, who Pedro Morales was a huge star in WWF, had a nice lengthy run. Stan the Man beat him. Nine days later, he loses the title to Bruno San Martino. Obviously, Stan the Man was only there to get it to Bruno, but it still gave Stan the Man Stasiak the rub, and now he's a former WWWF, you know, world champion. And then his son, you know, Meat slash Stan... Yeah, yeah. Can we call him Sean? Sean, Sean Stasiak. I, I, I'm really not crazy about referring to yeah, you know, another know. man like that. Is it? But, yeah. uh, and, and that's something that he he uses in his stuff, even to this day. Like, he's at, I saw a, vi- a promo video of him... Uh, maybe like a year or so ago, where he was trying to, he had like a hype video for him coming back to WWE and being them being the only father-son world champions in history. So he was making a push for that. Of course, it didn't go anywhere, but I mean. No. But, you know, that's that's just one example. Okay. Well, I like, and and for those of you who are not um, immensely knowledgeable wrestling fans, and I try to remember that, you know, come from the fan perspective and make sure one understands. But, you know, as you're going along in wrestling, sometimes you have, well, you know, here's where we are and here's where I would like to get. But, and they traditionally say that the, you know, shortest distance between two points is a straight line. However, in professional wrestling, it's not always the best way to go. Now, in your case, you were talking about Pedro Morales and Bruno San Martino. Yeah, you don't want to split the market with them. Right, you you had you had a champion presently, and you wanted to get to this guy, but having them go directly against one another was not necessarily the best for business. That you you didn't want to do that, so you had to have another way. And also, WWF, especially back then, was a babyface company. 
they usually had a baby face on top. You okay. know what I mean? For, and there was, you know, in Southern wrestling, it's the heel of the champion and the chase, right? Okay, yes. But but in WWF, in that Northeast region, it was, um, we have this big draw that's a baby face. We're going to build him up as basically Superman. Sure. And then eventually he'll get conquered, you know what I mean? And maybe he'll re- regain it back. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Well, Bruno San Martino uh, is ideal because he had a... Pedro he, Morales. Yes. Bob guys. Backlund. Hulk well, Hogan. <laughs> because if I remember correctly, uh, Bruno had one run of approximately seven years as the champion or something. I think, I think it was eight. Eight. Okay, something like that. Obviously, Eight and four, I think. But, hey, if he's selling out Madison Square Garden on a regular basis, mm-hmm. don't fix what ain't broke. Right, exactly. And, I mean, his – like, Chris Cruz is a guy that used to do um, – Commentary for WCW, but also did commentary for traditional championship wrestling when we when we had national exposure, and uh, he's a huge Bruno San Martino fan. Became friends with Bruno near the end of his career or life or whatever, and he just uh, always respected him and just the reverence that he talks about Bruno. You know, like the kind of man he was, not necessarily you know, not necessarily just professional wrestling. So like that kind of stuff carries over, and <clears throat> and really. I guess what I'm, one thing I thought about is, uh, let's say for Stasiak in this case, uh, even though he only held the championship for a short period of time, it did uh, really give a boost to his career. Obviously, he gets to say I'm a former champion, but in the role he's in, you had Pedro Morales, a very popular, beloved mm-hmm. um, figure. And and so it's like I took the championship away from him. I ended his championship run. It really, even when he's no longer champion, that that uh, I'm gonna say heat. That heat would stay with him and and within the minds of the audience. Is that yeah, the, is that, that the way to, to think of it? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's also something that's changed a lot over the years. Like back in the day, not everyone could be champion. Nowadays, everyone thinks that everyone needs to be champion. Everyone needs to get their shot. At that thing, and that's not the way it works. You have to make legitimate business decisions. Okay, this guy's going to make his money. This guy's good, but he's not going to draw us any money. But he's a good hand to have. There's been plenty of guys like that. And the in the what you could hang your hat on was if you got to work on top. You understand? Like maybe you didn't win the title, but you still got a program to where you were challenging for the title. That was a big deal. To a lot of guys, you know what I mean? And that's the way it should be. Like, I would, I've said this before, I would much rather have a business full of Roddy Pipers and Rick Rudes and Mr. Perfects and guys mm-hmm. like that than a, than a world full of Jack Swaggers and Dolph Zigglers that had runs that were completely substandard. Right. And, well, I, I guess two things. You, you mentioned one thing that has really been, um, kind of under my skin lately you mentioned how you know everybody wanting to be the champion or whatever as i watch the uh, across brands as i watch the product to ma- now it's almost it's not a matter of if you're the champion or if you've been the champion it's how many reigns you've had i constantly hear people i'm the 11th time champion of this i'm you know every time randy orton comes out all i hear about is the number he's had john cena was just back and he was talking about 16 going for 17 it's as though becoming the champion on any individual time has been diminished because now it's about who has how many dozen championships yeah and that's just that's a societal thing too i mean when tom brady wins how many super bowls I, five seven, seven. <laughs> I, think he's at, I think he's at seven now right i believe you know and you know that's that's kind of been just like um something that carried over in professional wrestling. Like, obviously, I remember when Flair Flair became, like, a six-time champion, and that was the record, remember? And, like, uh, that was a big deal. And, like, people, the six-time world, you know. Well, uh, Booker T, five-time, five-time, right. five-time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all those sorts of things, that's become the standard now. Right. Uh, in any event, we should stay more on the – I guess you could just say it more from a – promotion booking standpoint what is the thinking why you would want to use a transition champion so that those who in the audience can kind of understand what this is about so the reason you use a transitional champion is obviously like you said um, getting to point a to point b isn't it normally is a straight line but in our case you know you can't have a straight line sometimes sometimes you don't want pedro morales versus bruno san martino because obviously that's going to split your crowd and do this so 
if you're trying to get to another baby phase, then obviously you need a heel to bridge that because one, Pedro getting beat by a heel is heat, like you said, mm -hmm. and then Bruno beating a heel is the pop, is the payoff. So, like, um, that's what you're always trying to do. Like, we um, – me, for instance, like I don't do a lot of transitional champion stuff, but I mean there are there are some instances of where I've done it um, because that's what it called for. Like I'm trying to get to this guy. Well, I need I need this guy to put him over, you know. So it's not, and it's like I said, it's nothing to diminish anybody. You know what I mean? The people still get runs and still have their thing. It's just business, you yeah, know. It, well, it's it's a role in the story that's being told. Yeah. Uh, it may not be the main character, but supporting actors get Oscars too. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the way you think about it. I guess one thing, uh, the direction to go is I, uh, if you have more examples we could go through, it, it does help me understand as a fan when I see, well, oh, here's things I've seen, and we just you know go at sure. it that way if you've got some more you'd like um, to discuss. Well, there's one that's that's really, really important to professional wrestling history, and that's Buddy Rogers. Um, Buddy Rogers was the NWA um, World's Heavyweight Champion, and he, uh, he had a situation where he um, – I don't think he wanted to drop the title, but they, they, they were going to make him drop the title, and there was a disagreement or whatever it was. And uh, Luthez beat him in one fall, which back in the day, all title matches were two out of three falls. So uh, Fez beat him in a one-fall contest for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Well, then immediately the WWWF, headed by Vince Sr., okay. withdrew from the NWA, Oh. And then crown Buddy Rogers its world champion on the fact of he's still the world champion. He wasn't beat, beat two at, twice. He wasn't beat two out of three falls. Okay, but that Buddy ended up being just a transitional champion because the thing was he was already established and everybody knew who he was. Sure, but that's when Bruno's thing started. Twenty two days after that, that's when Bruno San Martino beat Buddy Rogers and started okay. that eight year reign. Okay, we're about. and became the champion. Okay, yeah. well, and there you have a guy who. And and that's a good business move. I, I can imagine. Uh, I guess this was Vince Senior, mm -hmm. thinking, uh, you know, Bruno's the guy I want to get there, and I need a way to elevate him, yeah, so to speak. And you know, Buddy Rogers is certainly a good way to. And do it And it was something like seventeen seconds, or oh, really? Yeah, it okay. Was, it was something really quick. So okay, that's interesting. Well, uh, hey, we just saw a, a less than thirty second <laughs> right. title change last weekend, so uh, those things do happen. Um, did uh, did you want to say anything more on that one, or were were there some others you'd like to get to? I don't. Yeah, want, there, I want a, to get a chance to get all the examples in we can. Sure. Like another one is, is still in that same era. Obviously, is uh, and this is a pretty famous one is Ivan Koloff. Okay. So Ivan, you know, we just talked about you know Bruno beating then Bruno went on an eight year run. Yes. Right, and then the guy that actually beat him in that eight year run was Ivan Koloff. Yes. And that's where, you know, uh, and that was a huge deal. Like, think about it. A guy that hadn't been beaten in eight years. Right. And then he's beaten. It's like, holy shit. That kind of woke everyone up. And then, uh, but Ivan ended up being just a transitional champion to get it to Pedro Morales. Sure. Because the whole thing, like we said, WWF was a, WWWF was uh, definitely a babyface company, but it was also a minority company, meaning that they put usually a minority who had a strong draw within the New York community on top. So Bruno obviously was the Italian-American sure. market. And now Pedro Morales, here we are, he's he's going to be the Hispanic sure. you know, thing. So And, like, that was kind of their mold for, for a while there, and it worked. Right. Well, the, the success, I mean, Bruno's – Success at selling out the garden is well established. Now it happened long before I remember watching, you know, and certainly nothing in the New York area was I aware of at that time. But, you know, the success they had with the Italian American community, you know, and among everyone else in New York City, selling out the garden, a tremendous success and using transition champions well. Right. So here's another one that um, is probably going to interest you. Okay. Quite a bit is um, Dusty Rhodes. Ah, Dusty did not have any lengthy reign as world champion. It was all transitional to get to the next guy, whoever that may be. Um, and I, I always felt I, I think I'd heard behind the scenes that 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 kind of bothered him because especially like when Flair won his first one, 
from him, right? Sure. Dusty hadn't been champion long, and he thought he was going to have a, a, a longer run. And then they pulled the rug out from under him, and Flair got hit. And the same thing with Flair. Flair didn't hold hold it long either because they didn't feel like he was ready. I think is like okay. they they just kind of like ah, I'm not sure. Yeah, but, well, he had one run. Now that was before the Flair for the gold event. I yeah, think. exactly. That's that when was the, where he came that was back. When, that's when that was when it culminated. Okay. Like, like the first title reign, he said was like very, you know, I'm not really sure of myself, you know, mm-hmm. like so it didn't really have the impact that they thought it would. So then he went away for a while, and when he came back, that was the flair for the gold, and obviously we know the history after that. I mean, certainly. Well, I guess there's a couple questions we we have mentioned how a uh, southern based, so to speak, southern style uh, tended to favor heel champions. Now Dusty Rhodes. Um, was a baby face. Yeah. I mean, almost exclusively, I guess. But largely, let's say largely for his career. Do yeah. you did, Would that have naturally played into a situation where he would not necessarily have uh, longer championship brains, you know, just based on where he primarily wrestled? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I mean, it very much is uh, could have been just a thought process at the time of, you know, hey, we need a heel on top for the baby to chase. You know, people will pay to see the blow off. You know what I mean? So we need to we need a, something big for that. But um, I think, and I asked Dundee this one time. I was like, okay, what's what's best, having a baby face on top or having a heel on top with the baby chasing? And Dundee said, whatever you fucking want to do, there's a way to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's that's kind of my thought process too. We've had we've had stuff where. Um, you know, me as a baby face, I've had long runs with mm-hmm. the championship as I am currently. Right. Right. But then we've also had where Dale Wild was champion for two, two years. Two years, yes. You know what I mean? I mean, so like to us, we've, we've done a little bit of both and we've done some transitional stuff every once in a while too. So, I mean, um, it just, like, you can do whatever you want if you know how to do it. All right. And, uh, and so to that degree, and I can understand, um, uh, it, well, professional wrestling is, as I've mentioned before, a, from an outside perspective, a collision between business and art, so to speak. And I can see how the artistic viewpoint for Dusty Rhodes could have said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to see, you know, a, kind of an appreciation. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me, you know, I, I have a longer run because of what I can do and what I've done for you in the past, so to speak. But ultimately, it's about whatever's most effective in you know, as Jr. says, putting a butt every eighteen inches. I think he yeah. may use other terms, but an ass. Every yeah, they, yeah, he likes to say that, uh, and I've heard him say that many times. And ultimately, that's what it's about. It is a profession. Mm-hmm. It is a business, and so whatever you really feel is best. So that's why you do it, and that's why you use uh, things like transition champions. Yeah, and and here's another one that's kind of similar to the Dusty Rhodes one that I think might actually surprise people. In the same sense, is. Uh, Mankind, Mick Foley. Yes. So Mick Foley is a three-time WWE yes. champion. Yes. His entire cumulative reign is only like 31 days or something. Okay. Yeah. Did you know that? No. I I knew it wasn't much, but it was never about defending the championship. It right. was about – well, it was about that night, and I believe it was in Worcester, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Uh, that night – it will forever live my mind in my mind because they yeah. talk. They talk about people changing the channels. I was one of those people. It did happen. I can very. I can testify. So right. so to speak. Testify. I can testify that that did happen in at least one case. Well, thank you, Devon. Yes. But uh, yeah, Foley, and that's what I'm saying. Look at the impact that he's had on the business itself, and he was only champion 31 days. So that's right. that's a prime example of somebody that capitalized on it, and it's not necessarily. You don't have to have an eight-year run like Bruno to to make it happen. If you if you have the talent and the wherewithal, then you can definitely you know make a career out of being a transitional champion. You know, and that's kind of what Foley did. He went from being a transitional champion to being um, basically a feature part of the show, and right. it all, and it really started with with that. You know, well there there was that and. And well, you we mentioned Roddy Piper's name, uh, a guy who never actually, you know, really had runs at all. But he is, you know, everybody. Well, you said Dun, um, Dundee said, well, there's a way to do anything, and so whatever it is your role is, 
make the most out of it. And I think that's what you're saying Foley did during his time. Yeah, I mean, you got to take – sometimes you have to take chick, chicken shit and make chicken salad. Right. You understand? And, like, that just happens to all of us, you know. So there's some things that you, you – maybe you don't agree with. Some, some things you just do because that's what the company wants you to do, and you just try to make the best of the situation. No one can agree on everything, right? So – um but that always leads to um, uh, more, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, more opportunities. Right. And just make the most out of what you got. Right. Um, well, I suppose, as I was, I was thinking here, uh, well, yeah, we still have a few more minutes here. Let's see. Uh, were there any others that you had that you wanted to? Well, let's, let's kind of keep going. You know, another one that really did change the course of, of wrestling history was the Iron Sheik. Okay. That that is certainly one that stuck out that so, I think would be good for you to talk about. So Bob Backlund, um, okay, let me let me back up just a minute there. Superstar Billy Graham, yes, right, won the title, right, certainly. And Vince Senior told him, and this is the way Vince Senior worked was, you're going to lose the title in a year. You're going to have a year run, that kind of thing, right? Well. They get into it, and Superstar Billy Graham becomes one of the hottest things in professional wrestling, right? But Vince Sr. was so dead set on his, his business model of, of doing that, he, he didn't call an audible and keep the title on him. Because what he easily could have done was he could have easily turned Superstar Billy Graham babyface, mm-hmm. and he kept it another year or two after that. But he stuck with his plan because he wanted a white meat ultra all-american baby face to be on top okay and there's where bob Backlund came in okay um and actually i had heard that uh i want to say it was steve kern that was actually originally pitched to vince like they he called eddie graham in florida and said hey this is what I'm looking for, and they pitched Steve Kern originally. Oh, okay. But then he then he saw Backlund and said, "No, I want Backlund." He's like, "Really?" Oh. He's like, "Yeah." So he got Backlund. So Backlund came up, and I like Backlund personally myself. Sure. But he didn't have that much of an impact on the on the houses. Like apparently, Vince Senior was having to try to um, build up the undercard to support the main event, as to where it should be the other way around, right? Yes. So, like, he was having to build up all these huge undercard matches to keep Backlund on top, and Backlund was on top for three years, four years, somewhere in there. It was, it was, a, wow. it was a lengthy time, and, like, um, eventually, you know, when it was time to make the switch, um, he lost the title to the Iron Sheik in the uh-huh. infamous Camel Clutch and Golden Boy Arnold Scollin, you know, throwing in the towel and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, a month later, three weeks later, whatever it was, that's when Hulk Hogan beat the Iron Sheik, and, okay. Hulk, and Hulkamania was born. Go on. Yes. <laughs> so I think that that whole to understand that whole thing is is important, uh, how, especially very important for wrestling history. All right. Well, yeah. Looking at that situation, you you have Bob Backlund, but going directly from Bob Backlund to Hulk Hogan would have been a disservice to business and. One or if not both of the competitors. Yeah, it wouldn't have gave it. It would have hurt Hogan. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because like he beat Backlund. You know and what I mean? That's not like we said, splitting the crowd. You know, he needed a, he needed to beat a heel, and why not beat yeah. one of the biggest heels? Yeah, at the you time? wanted to be a triumph that he's yeah. taking out, and and so you have the Iron Sheik, you know, who, you know, is not a fan favorite. Yeah. Very, very much. He was and throughout that, his career. And that's why I tell people all the time is like they do something in matches or they do something on promos and something like that and because they want to do it. And I'm like, okay, well, 75% of the people, you got 75% of the reaction you wanted right there. Why don't you just do it like this and get 100%? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, that's what we want, right? So, like, I think that gets misconstrued sometimes too as far as, um, you know, doing what's, like you said, what's right for business not right. necessarily what's right for you necessarily but what's right for business what's right. gonna, what's going to pop business right now obviously the iron sheet being a champion for long term might have been at least for in the case of vince senior in this case i believe uh would have been bad for business but by letting him be the transition now you've born what was you know started one of the more successful runs in professional wrestling history i, I think anyone would acknowledge that the yeah 
the success of Hulkamania. Yeah. Over four years on that title reign, too. Right. 84 to 88 before the, the infamous Saturday night's main event. <laughs> uh, double twin. <laughs> or twin double cross. That's what I was trying to say. But um, another uh, another one back to Hogan, obviously, is um, another transitional ch- champion is Sergeant Slaughter. All right. You know, and that one will obviously, you know, Slaughter turned his back on his country and became sure. an Iraqi sympathizer, right? And had all this heat. Then eventually, he he you know, he uh, he beat the Ultimate okay. Warrior with the help of Randy Savage and the sure. and the Scepter, uh, and he he was the, the dastardly, oh yeah, evil despised. despised you know foreign heel. So, um, and then Hogan gets to be the the red, white, and blue you know American. So. He wins it. He wins it at the Rumble, right? And then he loses it at WrestleMania. So really, his his reign was like three months or something like that, three four months. So, um, yeah, and he did. And like I said, he he did well. He did very well in that role. You know what I mean? He got what they need to get over, and that was one of the first WrestleManias that I actually think involved color. Oh, okay. Because Hogan actually bled in the in that All WrestleMania right. match. Um, and that's something that he could hang his hat on for the rest of his career, former WWF champion, sure. Sergeant Slaughter. Right. And, well, I guess the appeal of that is a guy who was so known as, G, you know, the real-life G.I. Joe, so to speak, then kind of being a traitor. Oh. <laughs> if anyone would like to gift me the the Sergeant Slaughter G.I. Joe, that's one of the things I want for my collection. <laughs> so if anyone has it in their heart. <laughs> My birthday's in June, I understand, but Christmas is coming up. For well, sure. So, all right, back to, let's see. Um, we, we talked about Flair um, in some sense, but, like, there's actually a point where Flair was a transitional champion, too. Okay, let's, yeah, let's talk about that. So, Flair obviously comes to WWF, wins the Royal Rumble, wins the title in the Royal Rumble. Yes. It is when the title was on the line in the Royal Rumble. Uh, wins the Rumble, goes to WrestleMania, loses it to Randy Savage. Right? Yes. A couple months down the line, he regains it from Randy Savage. But then six weeks later, drops it to Bret Hart, and that's when Flair's on his way out. Way. Soon, yeah. soon. He ends up doing the thing with Perfect, but, I mean, it was still soon after that. Okay. Yeah, it was towards the end. Yeah, so that was the, you know, Flair, someone's had, we yeah. we say 16, but it's actually more like 25, 26. Tyler. Sure. Uh, and the fact that he only has one of those as transitional kind of s- speaks the world of the impact and the draw that he had on professional wrestling. Right, but then when his turn came to be in that role, then he did it he because did it. that was business. Yeah, and he tapped out for Bret Hart and the Sharpshooter. So, right. I mean, what else do you want? Another one, fun one for me was um, Sid Vicious, or Psycho Sid. Yes. Uh, because, you know, that was a... A quintessential transitional champion because it was literally just to get it back to Sean. Like he obviously he beat Sean at the um, Survivor Series by hitting Jose Lothario with the with the infamous camera and giving him the heart condi- heart attack or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, and then you Great know drama. Yeah, and then you know he was then he power bombed Sean one two three won the title and he was champion until the Royal Rumble, which the Royal Rumble was held where San, San Antonio. Antonio. 50,000 people in San Antonio came to see Shawn Michaels uh, vanquish Psycho Sid. And well, that, yeah. And that was, that was, and that, that was right for business. Like, right. I think it added more. It didn't hurt Shawn not to be the champion walking in. No. It, it just made it all the more like, I got to see this. No. And yeah, yeah, that's what you – can he surmount this monster right. uh, that we have and, and bring this to an end? And, and I think both. Uh, performers play their role really, really well. Right. Uh, let's see here. Who else we got here? We got, okay, um, let's talk about Randy Orton. Yes. Randy Orton's first run um, was basically a transitional champion. Like, So Lesnar was the original youngest mm-hmm. WWF champion, champion of all time, right? Right. Well, then when Lesnar left <laughs> right. abruptly, right? Yes, um, there were um, some sore feelings, I guess, in the office, but they didn't want him well, having that. Uh, some of us in the audience as well, right, right. So they didn't want um, they didn't want 
him to have that that title or that that rub. Right. So they well, Randy Orton's here and he's younger. He's younger. He's younger, so they had him beat Chris Benoit. Oh, that name. That name that I can say, but many people cannot. <laughs> but he beat Chris Chris Benoit at SummerSlam 2004, you know, RKO 123, you know, whatever. Sure. And then he started like a then he flipped babyface because he got kicked out of Evolution. Right. Because the, Triple H the was thumbs down. The thumbs down, the Caesar's thumbs down um from Triple H because he was mad cuz he he became world champion instead of him. Right. So, turn yeah. him baby face, and then um, just like a month later, two months later maybe, mm-hmm. dropped it to Triple H, and then Triple H started the thing with Batista. Sure. And that's kind of where that all went. So, yeah, he was a transitional champion, but it was basically, like I said, just to get him as the youngest champion of all time. Well, yes. that Well, an, an opportunity to erase Brock Lesnar, that, that and particularly at that point in time, erase that element of Brock Lesnar from, well, look, the, the, the agitation with Brock Lesnar was not, Strictly in the office. Right, right. I, I'm still aggravated about it. <laughs> but anyway, we are over time. We oh, are okay. Just barely. Just barely. This is going to be one of the shortest episodes we've done in a while. So, All right. But uh, once again, for myself, the Golden Boy Greg Anthony, and for my co-host, Mark the Man, Tipton, thank you and goodbye.